so uh, I, I think, uh, Omid, would you, would you help in the videos? Um, and, yes, um, if the panelists are available and they're ready, they can share their screens in the order that they're presenting. No, no, they're not going to be. Uh, they're not going to be sharing their screens. Could you pin their videos? As oh, we, of course. As we've done last yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So let me let me introduce the panelists while while that's happening. Uh, so uh, the uh, panelists are uh, Garnet Chan from uh, from Caltech. Um, uh, he's um, Garnet is. Um, is um, is one of the one of the masters at this at this intersection of theoretical chemistry, uh, condensed matter physics, and quantum information. So it's particularly appropriate for for uh, for this talk. Actually, this the, you know uh, uh, Matthias's uh, talk ranged over quite a quite a number of subjects, and so this panel is uh, is really um, you know very appropriate for that. Uh, um, our next panelist is uh, Matthias, uh, Matt Hastings. Um, who um, who is a condensed matter theorist uh, from um, uh, also from Microsoft uh, Quantum, and um, he he has done a, a number of things. But from you know the thing that's closest to my heart is that he's uh, he's one of the one of the central players in in this uh, in establishing and doing uh, work in this area of uh, quantum Hamiltonian complexity. Um, um, our next panelist is, is Misha Lukin uh, from Harvard. He's, um, I, I believe he's, uh, uh, you know, to me he's unique in the sense that he's, uh, he's, he, he's also both an, a, a, a great theorist as well as an experimentalist. And his, uh, he's one of the, he's, he's, I think the principal architect of this spectacular work on, on coal atom systems for doing quantum simulations uh, at Harvard. Um, and finally, our la last panelist is uh, Brigitte Veli, um, uh, who is my colleague here at uh, at Berkeley. And um, uh, you know, she did um, uh, some of the earliest work on on decoherence-free subspaces uh, for for doing uh, quantum fault tolerance. Um, uh, she's she's also a quantum chemist, which is a, extremely appropriate uh, for what's being done here. And um, um, and uh, you know we've both been uh, uh, co-directors of the Berkeley Quantum Computing Center, uh, you know, which started in 2001. It was probably one of the first quantum centers around. So, uh, welcome everybody to the panel. Uh, so the 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 plan is to to have each of the panelists talk for you know about two two to three minutes to give their perspectives on on Matthias's talk as well as their 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 general. Uh, Opinions, and then, um, and then we'll go on to a panel discussion and, and audience questions. So, uh, well, welcome everybody and uh, to all the panelists, and, and maybe we could start with uh, uh, alphabetically with Garnet. Hey, hi. So, uh, so thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Um, I'm taking care of my baby right now, so you have, I may have to dash off depending on what I hear, but he seems to be okay right now. Um, yeah, so, so I thought it was, very, it was a very thoughtful talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I think, you know, there are many topics that Matthias, uh, Matthias uh, covered. So if I limit myself to quantum chemistry, um, I think the, the big question that needs to be addressed if one is using phase estimation um, is the problem of state preparation. And as we all know, that limits the power of phase estimation in a theoretical sense. So the real question is practically, uh, you know, is it a problem or, or not? Um, is it easy to obtain an initial state with good overlap or not? Um, and certainly, I mean, for some problems, it's not, but problems where it's very easy to obtain such a state often are the ones that are very easy to do classically. Um, so, um, in the catalytic cycle that Matthias showed, for example, those were systems where there's very good overlap with a mean field state, but one would argue that those problems are not the most challenging ones classically, right? So, so classically, you can find many problems where, say, the overlap with a mean field state is maybe very small, even in a small system, you know, maybe 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, something like that. Um, so that adds a significant uh, prefactor to phase estimation. Um, 
And if one scales up, then asymptotically, of course, if you just take a box of water, if you just, it's not very exotic, if you just take 30 water molecules, you know, the overlap drops below a percent already. So uh, with the mean field six. So one, you know, these are things I think one will have to grapple with um, in the evaluation of these costs. That's my, that's perhaps the main point that I would make. Great, Thank, thanks, uh, Garnet. Uh, and Matt, do you have? Uh... Uh, yeah, there was, um, I uh, very much appreciate the perspective that um, chemistry is one of the natural applications of quantum computers rather than big data. So um, just one sort of, I mean, this is almost an obvious thing, but I think it's not said enough in the field. I hear a lot of people saying things like, well, we'll see what algorithms we get once the computers are built. And certainly that's true, but I think we should always have in the back of our mind that um, if you propose a quantum algorithm, you should have at least some reason to think it will work. And I don't even mean a proof, but some basic reason. So chemistry is a natural application because it's high dimensional linear algebra and, and quantum computers can do that. But when we get into things like optimization, um, let me draw an analogy. Like if we talk about simulated annealing, this is a classical algorithm used in practice with many developments over the years. There's still a lot of work in proving when or if it does or does not work, but there's like an intuitive reason it works. You know, it's okay, well, we're just constantly lowering energy and every now and then we raise it up and come back down. Then you might ask about the adiabatic algorithm where you, it's, a, it's sort of a quantum version of simulated annealing where you start with a target Hamiltonian, which is some objective and you have a driving term and you interpolate between them. And you should say, why should we ever believe this works? And I think there's a higher bar for quantum because when you talk about quantum, you have interference and interference is very subtle. You know, if you have some idealized situation, interference can look beautiful. But if you just imagine, you know, you look at an interference picture and in something in optics where there's noise, it just looks like garbage and junk. And this is exactly what you see with the adiabatic algorithm that if you have some toy examples that are perfectly tuned, you can see a speed up. If you have, uh, I and Umesh and Andres Gillian have worked on this recently. Some constructed examples, you can show a speed up with an approvable speed up in an Oracle model. But there's now overwhelming evidence that if you put in sort of a, a, a generic target function chosen randomly or from in industry, that actually the interference hurts you, that it, it, it gives, leads to localization. And this is kind of a property. So I think there just needs to be this, this memory that like, if we want to propose a quantum algorithm, it should be something but uh, we have a, just at least some heuristic reason to think we can make the interference help us. So I think chemistry is really one of the natural reasons because it's exactly what a quantum computer can do. Thanks, thanks, Matt. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Misha, turning, turning to you. So I likewise very much enjoyed the talk. Uh, thank you, Matthias. So I agree completely that the first applications of these quantum machines will be scientific. And it's absolutely clear also that simulations will be the first uh, uh, kind of examples. And um, in particular, simulating dynamics, I think it's really, I would say, kind of the lowest hanging fruit. It's just simply because already with systems, which we have now, we can go to corners of Hilbert space where no one has ever been. And, you know, this is basically the kind of you know, work, which is the kind of path, which I would say is kind of to totally right for discovery. And I think we are already kind of entering the regime, you know, certainly in our experiments and also in others, where we basically, you know, trying to do kind of motivated a little bit, like what Ma Matt says, we need to have some, you know, no, you know, you know, some good ideas for places to look. And whenever we look, we almost always discover something new. And I would say, the areas like you know dynamics in particular, but also, for example, you know you know developing methods to devise entangled quantum matter. I think it's another you know the, you know direction. So I mean, maybe the main application here will be you know to help us to devise, for example, I don't know topological quantum computers, bigger quantum computers. But I view that that certainly as a kind of low you know kind of near term. Uh, um, uh, you know, direction, you know, uh, you know, to explore. And maybe one comment that I, uh, that I have about, you know, and actually maybe I also was a little bit confused about your example um, about, you know, involving Ising model. So I, I, I think, you know, 
it, I understand the argument about analog devices maybe not be as robust in the long term, but you know, I would say, you know, right now, you know, we should just go with what works. And many of the you know programmable devices, they can be operated either as gate devices or analog devices, and we can actually creatively combine. Maybe sometimes we should use adiabatic state preparation and then perform quantum phase estimation. So I think that's what kind of uh, you know the ideas that people put forward for things like co-design. I think these are really now we are in position where we can really take advantage of this. And just one last maybe small point. You know, you know I completely agree with Matt about you know like you know if one starts looking for you know uh, algorithms for optimization or maybe sampling where I think sampling perhaps quantum computers are a little bit better suited for. I mean, one should do it wisely, but, you know, that said, you know, I think also in this area, you know, we are also at the point that we can have, we, we create machines where we cannot simulate the dynamics. We can, we can run things which would be extremely hard to impossible to, to simulate. And I think this kind of dialogue where on one hand, you kind of have some intuition, you know, for places to look for, I mean, it's also good to have like negative results for places where not, not to look for, but really, for example, sorting classes of problems, optimization or sampling, where, you know, we could at least have some quantum speed up. I think this, you know, I, I, I feel that this is, you know, a really worthwhile and I would say a relatively near term goal. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. Let's talk in uh, Brigitte. Hi, right. thank you, Matthias. That was a great talk. Uh, I really actually appreciated the, the beginning when you actually really did a careful analysis of the clock time, the effect of the clock time, uh, not only in computation, but also in read-in and read-out. That was uh, something we don't often see a lot, and that's really important caveat. So I'd like to um, say a little bit about um, the quantum chemistry. So you focused on um, phase estimation and, oh, even if one has related uh, techniques for fully fault tolerant quantum computation, that of course does rely, as Garnet says, on having a good initial, or having some initial state that has some overlap with the, the true state and some guarantee of that. So, and there's, that means you have to have a lot of good ansatz and that's a lot of the focus of those of us that are working with uh, trying to implement um, various parts of quantum chemistry on these machines are actually focused on the same goal, namely generating um, good ansatzes. And I'd be curious to, I mean, so the goal in the NIST machines is to, because of the constraints of low depth quantum circuits, is to generate efficient representations. And so I, I'd be curious as to what you see, this seems to be a common goal, whether you're doing NISC or whether you're doing fault tolerant quantum computation. And specifically in terms of the dynamical correlation problem, which is where you say you've sort of landed right now with the catalysis problem, that's a place which is really ripe for input from classical computational com quantum chemistry, where there are all these tensor factorization methods and new approaches coming out, you know, basically almost monthly. Um, so I, 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 I would like to know, you know, what do you feel is the role that quantum computing on a NISC device would have to play in all of this, because I feel it's in fact, in a way, synergistic with looking at the long-term approach with um, quantum phase estimation. And also, what do you see that there are things that, that the classical computational chemistry can take back from this, all this very exciting work being done on new ansatzes and new ways to understand the couple cluster algorithm and so on. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Agita. So, Matthias, do you have uh, something to respond to all of this? Yes. So, let me respond to to Nigel. first, yes, we need new types of your answers to describe it. 
I think the big value in finding those and on something like Knigger, the will be to find good trial states that we could then use. The problem with the problem I see see with Knigger variation and methods is that they aren't exact. There's always an error, and phase estimation would give us really hey, here. This is this is really the the eigenstate. But then the value of NISC machine. I want to come back to to what what like Misha said that really we can use those machines in an analog way, in a hybrid way, and that way it is much more powerful than just using them them in a gate model way. With just the gate model, I'm skeptical. Because if you want to achieve for an intractable problem of 100 orbitals, let's say, if you want to, to achieve chemical accuracy in the energies on a NISC machine, the error rates have to be extremely low, as you know. But, but maybe you don't have to achieve chemical accuracy. Maybe if you're developing an approach that would give you, say, a set of energy levels and give you the right ordering of those energy levels, for a, particularly for a complicated system like your cat catalytic systems, maybe that would already be very important yeah. and sufficient. And so, also, you don't need to you don't need to restrict yourself to a variational approach either. Okay, so you can start from that. Yeah, mean, yeah, and and then do something as lately. Yes, I agree with that. But then why do? You, but then I say really use the power of the analog machine. Yeah, as much as you. So, so Matthias, may, may I ask a question? Um, so, so can, can we, um, I, I'm, I'm slightly unclear here, you know, uh, I think Misha brought up the issue of programmability, which seems quite important. So once you, have, once you have a programmable machine and it's not error corrected, it's essentially a programmable analog machine. So, uh, so now could you, you know, you're, you're further dis distinguishing between a programmable analog machine which does a restricted gate set versus versus something else and can you say what the something else is i would say just use all of the native operations the machine has and don't limit yourself to just the standard gate set mm -hmm. misha yeah i mean so, 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 yeah i agree completely that's exactly i think that's a recipe for the progress in the near term, right? That is what people call co-design, right? You just really need to try as much as possible, kind of use your native interactions to encode the problem in the most efficient way. And this might not be enough, but then what you need to do on the top, you know, you don't need to start from scratch. So, so Misha, I mean, I, I definitely agree that this would be better, but I'm curious, perhaps you can tell me if you're given some chemistry Ham Hamiltonian that's phrased as some fairly arbitrary looking four Fermi terms, without sort of programmability and really implementing rotations and CNOT gates and so on. Is there a good way to implement that more natively? Yeah, it, it is, you know, this specific, you know, um, this specific example is definitely a challenge. Uh, you know, you know, but, you know, I would say, you know, there are ways to explore. So for example, if you have, you know, systems with long range interactions, Right, you can definitely start, you know, kind of relaxing a lot of this, you know, kind of, you know, assumptions. I mean, for example, if you want also, if you want to simulate, you know, fermions, just just simulating fermions is extremely costly with qubits, right? Exactly, so that, unless you, I mean, if you have... That, that's you another, know. that's another. So I think these are the directions which I feel for chemistry specifically, these directions, I would say I really underexplored. So, I mean, to, to what extent this will eventually succeed, you know, okay, it's an open, you know, it's, it's an open question, but we see many, many examples, you know, and, you know, we see that the problem is many algorithms are very easy to analyze once you decompose things into kind of gates and so on. And, you know, it is also in terms of implementation, you know, I think there are some theorems, you know, showing that this kind of bang, bang, you know, short pulse controls, you know, they are sort of ideally would be the best. You know, there were, you know, mathematical theorems which are proven, but in practice, it's just not like this because every time you hit your system, 
you know, you might create some, you know, some amount of kind of desired evolution, but then you also create some evolution which is undesired. In principle, you can always undo it, you know, in the next steps, but just in practice, that's not, you know, in particular, if you're if you're highly entangled state, if the system is chaotic, you know, forget it, you know? So these are the kinds of things which I, I, I think we are learning it now hard way. And I think that's where basically, you know, I, I think that's an area where algorithm design, you know, you know, hardware design and maybe applications really need to kind of converge, you know? I mean, that's at least one, you know, kind of direction that I see. Great. Um... You know, there, there's uh, maybe maybe you can also open it up to questions from the audience. Um, I, I see that uh, Marcus Greiner has a has a question. Marcus, do you want to? Um, yes, hello. Sorry, I didn't realize that we're, uh, we were still within the panel. Uh, but um, right, I just wanted to follow up on the idea of um, using fermions to natively implement fermionic degrees of freedom. Um, um, kind of like um, if I think about optical letters, for example, if you make this more programmable, right, um, like a Hubbard model, uh, it seems really interesting. And I think there's actually not even much understanding right now. Um, uh, other than that is potentially very powerful, but uh, much understanding how this exactly maps. Of course, you can always map it uh, to a qubit system, but that has a lot of overhead. In particular, it seems to uh, always turn a local Hamiltonian into a highly non-local Hamiltonian. And in this context, uh, um, I wonder, or um, um, I'm curious if there uh, are opinions on like how this, um, how implementing a fermionic degrees of uh, freedom naturally could also help in general if you uh, then, for example, realize it in a local Hamiltonian, but this maps to a non-local Hamiltonian that um, otherwise would be much harder to solve. So I would say once you have something fault tolerant, then the, oh, 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 the, then the, the, the overhead can be small and constant only. But in the NISC area of something the analog, that's really hard. And so for the NISC area, I really like the work that you do on using fermionic atoms to solve the fermionic model. That's the the much simpler like, way of getting there. Actually, one quick question. Is it clear that once you're fault tolerant that your quantum computer isn't uh, isn't better at, at implementing local models? It's, it seems like it will still benefit from some kind of locality and communicating qubits far away will always be harder in some way. Do you think of this locality if you talk about uh, uh, quantum it, computing or not? It, so also, for non-local models, the, the work we did in years back, uh, back with Matt Hastings shows that you can reduce the over head to a constant. Hmm. Right. Yeah, so but... you have to calculate many parities, but you can uh, can uh, reuse it in such a way that uh, that it doesn't cost you too much mm -hmm. so so can can you can some somebody say uh, what are the prospects of actually um, implementing a fermionic quantum computer before before answering that, just one quick comment on local local can even if you're computer is completely non-local. There can be some advantage for simulating if the Hamiltonian you try to simulate is local because there's some Lieb Robinson based methods that can get you close to the theoretical optimum uh, for simulation because you can perform simulation in local blocks and stitch it together. So there's some advantage for locality, but um, maybe not maybe not so important, just, just worth mentioning. For the fermions, there are, are, are many quantum simulators 
das ist ein Jusiger, die Firma und so, die weiß, das ist ja super, das ist ja eine Lage in der Audience, das ist eine Marke, das ist ein Tillmann, das ist eine Dame, die vor mir ist, already. Michel, was ist der Post? Pact of your red bag atoms. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so, or something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, so red bag atoms, they kind of very naturally imp implement long range interactions in a kind of highly programmable way. So, uh, the red bag atoms are kind of more naturally suited for realization of qubits or, you know, like the, the, the systems which don't have it, or it, it then basically kind of tunneling, you know. So, sorry. Okay. But, um, so, and, you know, in a way, kind of, maybe that's one limitation of current Hubbard simulators that they all, be, you know, in all of them, the interactions are local. So um, I think for this kind of, for the spin qubit models, we are already kind of enjoying this, you know, we're starting to explore this kind of long range interaction as a, as a control knob for, for, pro for programmability. So, I mean, it might be interesting to ask, you know, questions if there are, you know, chemi chemistry models where you don't need to simulate, you know, fermionic degrees of freedom, where, you know, it's just to have basically effective spin model, which potentially have long range interactions could, could be already, you know, sufficient. Uh, but on the other hand, I think certainly, you know, people like Marcus and Tillman, they're also thinking how to sort of bring this, you know, this thing, the best of both worlds together, how to have both fermionic systems and long range interactions, which I think would go a long way towards, you know, all the kinds of things we are discussing. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Eddie Fari has a question. Yes, Hi, can Eddie. you hear me okay? Hi everyone. Well, I, you know, Matt said something that stimulated me you know, Matt said that we should only look for algorithms when we have good reasons and understanding. And, you know, I think understanding is very overrated. And I think that what I really do, and I think that we should look for things where we have mathematical techniques that allow us to proceed. And I'll give you an example, the QAOA. I mean, at the QAOA, we were able to get worst case performance guarantees at the shallowest depth. We're able to show in the last few years that by averaging over instances, we could get new results. We, on the SK model, we were able to average over instances, take the n goes to infinity limit, and analyze the algorithm at arbitrary depth. We also were able to show limitations of the algorithm on random instances of maximum independent set. We were also able to show that the algorithm has quantum supremacy at the shallowest depth. So it seems to me that, you know, instead of asking for insight, we should go to a place where we have specific techniques and work on it. And yet the community seems disinterested in that question. And I'm just pointing that out. And I don't think it's helpful to say you need insight before you do it. That's just my opinion. Um, yeah, well, so Eddie, I mean, there's certainly yeah. a lot of it. mathematical techniques, of course, that is that that is valid too. And I think the stuff you're talking about is all great work in terms of um, mathematical physics, better understanding of specific random models. Um, but if we want to ask, will QAOA, for example, in the, in the simplest form of, you know, the simplest form, I know there's a lot of cases where you might structure it or so on, but the thing where you say we're going to just take X and some arbitrarily chosen objective and optimize angles and do some fixed number of rounds. You know, I, whether this should work, I mean, I think we should, I don't, I don't know if your belief is that it should work. My belief is that there's, there's no reason to think it would work. And sort of my belief gets down to this understanding, which is, you know, you had this really nice result showing that the max three lin two, this was the first, you know, I think this really created the interest in that algorithm, um, uh, better performance than known for classical algorithms. But very quickly it was followed up with, classical improvement. And then um, there's a very simple classical algorithm that just matches the performance of QAOA, which is just initialized spins in a random classical configuration and everybody moves a little bit towards their neighbor. At, and those at most depths. At, 
at people. Yeah, yeah. And, at those yeah, shadows. And there's, yeah, matches. Well, that was the case where, you know, QAO got the excitement with P equals one and then continued work. You know, I did work on other models of P equals one and then there was a follow-up by someone else at P equals two. It's just seeming like these simple classical algorithms are outperforming QAOA as far as I can tell at every fixed depth. But regardless of whether or not they're outperforming it, you know, in the details, I think if you get down to like, why was QAO working? It was because it was mimicking that move a little bit towards where you're trying to go. You know, you're trying to get towards where your neighbors push you. So just move a little bit towards it. Yeah. And this is, this is sort of evidence that that's why it was working because these classical algorithms are matching its performance. These ones which just do that incredibly simple, like do a little local update at some fixed depth and do it for some number of rounds. Um, those match the QAOA. And uh, um, so if we want to think the QA, I mean, d d disregarding all the, the beautiful mathematical work on it, if we want to think that it's going to be a practical algorithm, there should be some argument like why doing this local update quantumly might be better. And I, I don't, I don't see that. Um, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe. I don't either, but, you but know, for example, we were able to show that, you know, the, uh, random instances of maximum independent set that um, the QAOA would not, could, would, there were barriers to it unless the depth grew logarithmically with the problem size. So I certainly believe that if you take fixed depth QAOA in the limit as the problem size gets infinite, except for the SK model, for, because that model, you see the problem, well, maybe we shouldn't get too much into QAOA. I mean, we don't want to get too much really talk about chemistry, but I don't want to overdo it in terms of this specific thing. But um, I don't have a good reason to think it should work, but I also don't have a good reason to think it shouldn't work. I mean, who knows? Maybe the QAOA, when you, um, you know, take it to depth logarithmic in N, will be Coleman's-Williamson. I don't know. It, I honestly it, don't know. Yeah, I mean- and I don't it, think there's any evidence it won't. It may, but but oh, let me so let me just yeah I, I'll, I'll stop talking. I don't want to get to. But you know if we think it does, and I think it's very interesting to ask what it may do, and to ask what completely local classical algorithms may do. These kind of sure. local classical algorithms may do at that depth. But I think if you were to succeed, or someone were to succeed in getting like a really you know whatever, and there's all kinds of interesting things you can do, and it's great yeah. because it's a framework for addressing these. It's I think the good thing is a framework yeah. for addressing them. But there should be some sense of um, how we should pick these. Uh, these angles well, that might lead to appropriate constructive interference, because as soon as you get beyond the high girth graph, you start having different local structure. You'll see not just the tree, and then you have to make the interference work out right for all these configurations. Just my feeling, and of course everyone may be led in their own way, but my feeling is like you should have some motivation for picking the picking it to make the interference work right. So maybe well, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. It's okay. Can I? Can yeah, I, that's I, fine. Everybody work, you know, motivates themselves in their own way. And, you know, it's fine, yeah. I don't need to have a preconceived notion or I don't have to understand. Like for example, the, um, the, the NAND tree where we showed that, you know, the quant by quantum walk, you could beat the best classical algorithm for evaluating a NAND tree. I have no insight in that. I don't know why that works, no. And you had to beat the best classical algorithm. Did you start with some really serious intuition when you when absolutely you not? Absolutely no? not. Let me absolutely no? not. We were working on a different problem. Right, but and you know, we, in retrospect, and let me in just finish. The entry is perfect because it's it's a case where you can see what the interference does. Maybe only after you've got it, you can see what the interference. Does. I can't. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> but but no. But let me just answer Umesh's question. Umesh said. You know, no, we did not. What happened was we were looking at a different problem and we saw for, with quantum walks and we saw that there was a recursion involved in that problem. And then we saw that that recursion was the NAND. So then we solved the NAND tree problem. We didn't set out to solve that problem. We discovered the recursion, which was the solution to the NAND tree problem by looking at a different problem. You know, so I think that's much more typical of how you make progress is you try things and then you solve other problems. And that's why I'm not warm to this position of, you know, uh, knowing what you're doing in advance. I think it's better to just try. Anyway, I'm going to stop. I, I, if I can add something there, I mean, I think it takes both. I mean, 
there's sure. many different kinds of approaches mm -hmm. and uh, all yeah. approaches should be, the community as a whole should try all those approaches. Absolutely, yeah. the community should try all. Maybe but, actually, me, yeah, go, go, ahead. go ahead. All right, That's so it. I just wanted to come back to the suggestion about um, maybe simulating uh, quantum chemistry with long range spin models. So mm -hmm. I've gone, it's back here. I mean, there is activity in the classical chemistry community, classical, classical quantum chemistry community to make spin models for, for um, some types of quantum chemistry systems, I think, especially for excited states. And maybe Garnet can say something more about that. I, I don't know how long range they are, but that's certainly something that might in this context of these catalytic systems be useful to just sort of explore the, uh, in, in Matthias, in your, in your sense of exploring the entire landscape of this uh, excited reactive system, it might be useful to, to map out that landscape with an effective spin model first. Yeah, I mean, there are, I mean, you know, spin models emerge from chemistry, right? So there are, if you take the same condensed mass systems where the low energy physics is described by spin models and then take a finite chunk of that that you might see in a the molecule, then the low energy physics is to some approximation described by spin models. And that they are, of course, good, good choices for like more simplistic quantum simulations. Although at the level of, um, you know, once targeting high accuracy, the approximation yeah. that you're making by reducing the spin model, you know, removes the, you know, the claim that one is uh, obtaining yeah. high accuracy. Yeah, but, but maybe one direction that one could pursue is to try to basically benchmark the, this, you know, the chemistry kind of codes against, you know, accurate solution of this, you know, kind of highly entangled, you know, highly correlated long range model. So I think this, I think this is a kind of, you know, the convergence of different directions, which I think, you know, our community would really benefit from. I think, you know, that would be, in my view, that would be, you know, very good, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, these um, these faithful comparisons of classical costs versus, you know, uh, careful estimations of quantum costs are certainly important, right? That's it. And, um, um, and you know, I'll come back to my original point where I, I think that, the biggest uncertainty in that cost, or perhaps the biggest factor that one will need to grapple with is the state preparation cost in the quantum algorithm. So um, I think we do not have enough information there. Uh, but um, yeah, I agree. It's good, good to have validated systems where we do this type of comparison. I have, I have another question to Matthias. Do you really, or does Microsoft really need, what did you say, eight or nine digits of precision? In those energies? Say, if I look at the molecule where the total energy is a kilohartry, and I want to measure things to millihartry, then it's. Okay. Then but if, you, if you make a. In the total energies, of course, we are only interested in the relative energies. Yes. And that, yeah. and that yeah, no. can can make it easier. Yes. But if you want to go to millihartries, then we have. To propagate for a time that is cell inverse of millihartry. So the, the time and need for the propagation really depends on the energy accuracy that I need. That's if you take the entire molecule though, then, right? No. All, all the electrons, because if you're only considering. I, okay, so yeah. let's say when I look at a smaller active space, I still need to get to the same precision. Yeah, yeah. Really hard, and so the time I need to propagate is still the same. Okay, yeah. Advantage if I throw out the big term, the advantage is I can maybe do bigger time steps. So the complexity can go down. So when I remove all of the big terms in the model and focus on the smaller ones only for an active space, then I may be able to do bigger time steps, but I still have to go to the same time. Total, total. Yeah. To, yeah. So yes, there is an advantage restricting the model, yeah. but it's indirect through the, through the time steps. Yeah, yeah, Misha. I just want to make one point to cut, you know, actually about the discussion between Matt and Eddie. So I personally think we need actually kind of many more examples, you know, like QOA, you know, because 
and you know i completely i you know it you know it's completely clear that is not cannot be you know one cure for all and i mean you are completely right matt that developing this intuition when these coherences would you know when these things would interfere in the right way maybe that will be a solution maybe this is where you know examples where algorithm you know certain algorithms like qua you know certain graphs that they will perform very well you know and having this kind, but you know, these kind of you know examples and intuitions. And remember, now we are in this you know era of quantum discovery, where we have actually machines with you know over you know two hundred qubits, which can actually you know kind of test these things beyond this short shallow depths. You know where you know maybe we could you know outperform you know Eddie's you know insightful, you know, proofs and, you know, and both kind of test things beyond this shallow depths. I think that's, this is a very, very special time in that sense. And, you know, I think we just need more examples of this, of, of, of these times, things we could try, but again, you know, kind of with direction where to look, you know? So well, let me, let me agree with you. And let me also say that, you know, um, I, I draw a distinction between how we look when we do research and how we talk when we talk about our outlook for what may happen. I mean, we may try all these things, but if we want to say that we think, not just that it may work, but if like we want to be honest and say like, we think this will work, not, not that it may work, but that we think there is a good chance that this will work, then we can do it, as you say, using some simulators, or we could do it using really high performance numerical simulation using and attention to scaling methods. Maybe we're limited up to perhaps around 40 qubits, depending upon what machine we use, what kind of accuracy we need, properties of the circuits. But then not just, you know, <clears throat> I, I see too many papers on the archive where they're like, oh, we did this circuit at 20 qubits with all these optimizations and it beats some classical algorithm, which scales to, you know, whatever. It's, it's, it needs to be really a careful scaling work. And this is the kind of thing Matthias and I did with Dave Wecker and others, um, with some of the stuff he talked about, you know, really looking classically the sizes you can get increasing the size and paying careful attention to scaling if, if there's to be a claim that, that something will work. So we must try all these things, but. No, no, absolutely. I think that kind of, that's, you know, I mean, the careful benchmarking and understanding, you know, I would say at this point is just really understanding scaling would be really kind of, I mean, it would point us, I mean, like we are, you know, we are kind of looking and just, you know, in a wide open space, you know, and basically at this point, every, you know, you know, any direction we could, you know, you know, provide basically, and I'm talking about us as a community, I think it would be super helpful, you know? And I think, you know, if you have, you know, so one example with one qubit system, this would inform greatly what you should be doing with other qubit systems or also in terms of algorithms. No, no, I absolutely agree that you cannot just, you know, do basically simulation on, or on a small, you know, system and just, make grand conclusion, you know, from that. But I think we are in a position when we can start at least looking over like a decade in terms of number of qubits. I think that's what is very, very special, you know? So. so it's a, yeah, just, it sounds like the conclusion is we should, we, should be, we should feel free to think about anything, explore anything, but maybe we should, we should think twice before publishing these things. <laughs> yeah. I'd say one should have a reason for pursuing something. <laughs> Motivation. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, we are, um, uh, this, this was a fantastic uh, talk in a panel. Uh, we can continue the discussion in Gather Town. So I posted the link on chat. Uh, so for, for everybody, you know, panelists, uh, uh, attendees, anybody who'd like to, like to join and continue the discussion. So, um, Again, you know, I'd like to really thank uh, Matthias Troyer for, for a very thought-provoking uh, colloquium and, and to the panelists for, uh, for, for this, you know, fantastic discussion. And actually also, also to the audience because um, it was a, you know, they, they were, it was really a vigorous discussion. Uh, um, so um, we'll be taking a break from the colloquium next week. It's spring break here officially in Berkeley. I don't know what that means this year, but, uh, but for what it's worth. And then we'll continue the week after on the 30th with uh, Yuan Tang uh, speaking about uh, quantum machine learning. So, uh, so again, thank you all and see you at Gather Town. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.